Good afternoon, everyone. I have the pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Megan Wright, who has only last month received her PhD in chemical biology. She's been at the ICB since 2008 and is a perfect example of the many success stories that there are at our CDT. So I would like to introduce her about her talk on chemical biology for drug discovery. Thank you very much. Um, and <laughs> And thanks to Pietro and the other organisers for giving me the chance to give this talk. So my research is interested, I'm interested in um, the modification of proteins. Um, now you may know that we have about 20,000 protein encoding genes in our genome, but that doesn't mean that we're limited to 20,000 proteins. And protein and genes are, are first of all, um, uh, transcribed to give R messenger RNA and then this is then translated to give the proteins that make up the machinery of the cell and each gene can actually produce several different kind of <coughs> flavors of protein um, but the story doesn't end there and each protein can be modified in literally hundreds of different ways with really diverse uh, chemical groups um, and this gives, provides the cell with a way to very rapidly and very dynamically modify the function of the protein. So these proteins aren't interacting and carrying out their function in isolation. They form part of really complex networks. And this is the biochemical pathways wall chart from Roche. And I don't know about you, but I think that's frankly terrifying. And so part of the idea of chemical biology is to try and make some sense out of this biological complexity. And one of the things that I'm interested in is how the modification of proteins fits in. So how is protein modification important? Well, an example of a protein modification is phosphorylation. And this essentially just adds a negative charge to a protein. And this, of course, influences what might bind to the protein. It can influence its three-dimensional structure. And the cell can dynamically modify this backwards and forwards, maybe switching the protein on and off. Um, another example is ubiquitination, and this is the attachment of a kind of string of smaller proteins. And this tells the cell, this protein is ready for degradation, uh, get rid of it. And so obviously that has a big function, a, a big impact on these, on these pathways. And the modification that I'm interested in is called lipidation. So you can see these are really quite diverse. So lipidation, typically directs proteins to membranes. So the cell membrane is essentially the skin around the outside of the cell, and it's formed of these uh, molecules called lipids. So this little balloon is representing a lipid. It has um, uh, a head that is, is water-loving and a tail that is water-hating. So the tails <coughs> tend to sort of assemble together um, to keep the water out, and so this is how you form these layers. And if you attach a kind of greasy tail onto a protein, then it will tend to localize to these membrane structures. Um, and this might be very important for the function of the protein. For example, maybe the other uh, molecules that it interacts with are localized in this membrane. So protein modification can have a huge variety of roles, um, including sort of altering the three-dimensional structure of a protein and also altering where it goes in the cell to carry out its function. And the particular modification that I'm interested in is uh, called meristylation, and it's the attachment of this lipid onto proteins. And this process is catalyzed by an enzyme called NMT. Uh, so how does NMT carry out its function? Well, what it does is it binds the protein, shown in green. It also binds the lipid, uh, which is attached to this carrying molecule, this, this shown in yellow. And then it just transfers this lipid onto the protein. And these, pro these proteins that are now lipidated can localize to their uh, correct place in the cell. And cells aren't just a single membrane full of, of molecules. They also have loads of different membrane compartments, um, kind of compartments within compartments. And so these proteins can localize to all different places in the cell. So how do we go about studying this protein modification? Well, it's really like looking for a needle in a haystack because this may be very 
a very low abundant protein, and this modification is really difficult to detect against the complex background of, of all the other proteins in the cell, all that other functionality. So what we're doing is we're taking a chemical approach to this problem. We're replacing this lipid molecule with one that is only subtly different, so it contains this small chemical tag on the end. And this tag is all we're going to need, as you'll see in a minute, to detect and identify and understand what's happening to this, to this protein. So in a sort of general case, we can mimic any modification with a sort of tagged modification in this way. So how do we get this modified uh, lipid onto the proteins? Well, we don't know what these proteins are. We might not know what, what, what these proteins are. And so we get the cell to do it for us. So we take our chemical probe, we add it to our cells. Each of these is a, is a little cell. Um, it gets incorporated into the proteins because the cellular machinery just doesn't notice this tag because it's such a small change. We then need to detect this tag against the background of all the other proteins. And we can do this because um, uh, we do this by basically labeling the protein with something that's going to be useful. For example, something fluorescent. And we can do this because we can react the tag with something that will capture it, something that will, will get hold of it, um, in a very selective chemical reaction that's actually commonly known as click chemistry because it's just like clicking these two molecules together like they're Lego bricks. So this is a, is a really, really powerful reaction in the context of biology. So what can we now do? Well, we can, we can try and analyze our proteins using a fluorescent probe. So we separate out our proteins. So this is just each of these bands is an individual protein. The big ones are at the top and the small ones are at the bottom. Um, if we look in the fluorescence channel, then we see all these bands corresponding to proteins that are labeled. So in this way, we can detect the fluorescence of the, of the label that we've introduced. We can also use a different label that is sort of effectively like a bit of Velcro and allows us to stick our proteins to um, some beads. And therefore, we can isolate these proteins, we can identify them, we can study them. Um, and because we're chemists, we like to design reagents that have got several functionalities on them so that we can do all of these kind of analyses at once. So I'm going to very, very quickly give you an example of how we're applying this technology in disease. And one of the diseases that I'm interested in is malaria. And malaria is a very serious tropical disease causing over 200 million cases a year and nearly a million deaths. And it's caused by this little single-celled parasite that gets injected into your body when a mosquito bites. And this parasite has a complex life cycle. It lives for a little while in your liver. And then it goes into the bloodstream, and what it does is it forces its way into the red blood cells and replicates until the poor red blood cell just bursts. Um, and then more parasites reinvade. And this cycle gives rise to the symptoms of malaria, the fever, and the anemia. And we can study this in the lab. So we can take blood, and we can take parasites, and we can grow the parasites. Um, and in this way, we can study plasmodium. So we were interested in can we identify and study lipidation in this organism? So we took our probe and we fed it to our parasites and we carried out our analysis and we found that these proteins that are lipidated are involved in all kinds of processes in the cell, including, for example, the process where the parasite invades the red blood cells. And so we were interested in if you can add an inhibitor of lipidation, then you can potentially inhibit all of these different processes all at once uh, and therefore kill the parasite. Um, so this is a compound that was developed by one of my colleagues, Mark Rackham, and it acts by inhibiting lipidation. So how it does that is it just binds where the protein would normally bind and prevents the lipid from being transferred. And so we used our sort of panel of chemical tools to study this. We added our probe and we added our our inhibitor, this compound here. And as we increased the amount of the inhibitor, we saw that we were able to detect the loss of lipidation. And we were able to quantify this, and we were able to compare it with how quickly this killed the parasite, and it did kill the parasite. And we were able to show 
that by inhibiting this process, you can, you can kill malaria parasites. Um, so hopefully um, in this brief talk, I've given you a bit of insight into how we can use a diverse set of chemical tools in combination with lots of different biological techniques. Um, and that we can use these to understand the biological system better and to also explore the effects of potential drugs. And that if we can better understand the biology, then potentially we can develop uh, better drugs against diseases like malaria. Um, so I have lots of acknowledgements. I'd like to thank all of Team NMT, so we're all involved in trying to develop anti-parasitic drugs, particularly the people I've highlighted in bold. Um, other collaborations and members of my research group, especially my supervisors. Um, the funding bodies, uh, particularly the ICB and the PSRC, of course. And thank you for your attention. We might have, might have time for just one short question, if you have one. Otherwise, we'd like to thank again Megan. And just